Hello, I'm Charlotte Faust, a senior here in the literature department, and this is my argument on the inheritance of Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. The year is 1986, the place, New York City. Three black men, Michael Griffith, Timothy Grimes, and Cedric Sandiford, were walking from where their broken down car had stranded them on Cross Bay Boulevard to Howard Beach. Upon entering the Jewish-Italian neighborhood, the three men were verbally accosted by a small group of white pedestrians who promised violence. But Griffith, Grimes, and Sandiford were worn down and hungry, so they stopped at the block's pizza joint to grab a slice and use a payphone. When they left to return to their car and Curtis Sylvester, who they had left to watch it, they were attacked by a mob of 12 white men who had been waiting for them with bats, tire irons, and other improvised weaponry. All three black men were injured by the mob, but when Michael Griffith tried to escape by running across the expressway, he was hit and killed by a passing vehicle. Two and a half years later, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing arrived in theaters. As the opening credits roll, we learn that Lee's film has been produced by his own production company, 40 Acres and a Mule Productions, a name that signals his interest in the intertwined histories of race and property in the United States. As literary critic Henry Louis Gates Jr. and historian Eric Foner explain, the phrase 40 Acres and a Mule is a touchstone of Black American culture. It signifies the land distribution that we was radically proposed by 20 Black leaders in Savannah, Georgia, when they met with General William Sherman in 1865. This land distribution would eventually be named 40 acres and a mule, which were to be apportioned to formerly enslaved Black families. Yet, this property redistribution never happened. By naming his production company after this famous, if unrealized, plan for reparations, and by using property to organize the racial politics of this film, Lee invites us to consider Do the Right Thing as an engagement with the relationship between race and property. By reading Do the Right Thing through this lens, we can perceive Lee dramatizing the competing contexts of de jure and de facto ownership and their relationship or lack thereof to black property rights. The Oxford English Dictionary defines de jure as by right according to law and de facto as in actual existence. With these contexts, we find Lee's question of what does it mean to own something appear over and over again as a backdrop to property ownership and destruction in Do the Right Thing. In the film, Lee envisions two owners, each at odds with the other. First, we have Sal, who lays claim to his pizzeria, Sal's Famous. Aligned against him are the black citizens of the block, who lay claim to the block as a whole, including that which is affixed to it, such as Sal's Famous. This struggle is illustrated by Buggin' Out's request for black representation on Sal's wall. Yo, Mook! A couple of words of tie, okay. Mook! So you know I'm still... What? How come you got no brothers up on the wall? Man, ask Sal, right? Hey, hey, Sal, how come you got no brothers up on the wall here? You want brothers on the wall? Get your own place. You can do what you want to do. You can put your brothers and uncles and nieces and nephews, your stepfather, stepmother, whoever you want, you see? But this is my pizzeria. American Italians on the wall only. Take it easy, man. Huh? You, hey, don't stop with me today. What? Yeah, that might be fine, Sal, but uh, you, you own this. Rarely do I see any American Italians eating in here. All I see is black folks. So since we spend much money here, we do have some set. Sal, the de jure owner of the pizzeria, establishes his sense of ownership through his emphasis on the possessive my thus justifying his use of his rights to exclude others from the use of what is his. In his de jure system, if he holds rights over the pizzeria, no one else can. Buggin' Out, on the other hand, posits his de facto rights to the space through the continuous financial support made by him and the other black residents of the block, as they all spend much money there. Not only that, but they also spend significant amounts of time at the pizzeria, which itself allows them another kind of de facto customary ownership over that space. With these claims, Lee juxtaposes de jure and de facto rights of ownership. Not only do they privilege different owners, but they contain different allowances. Sal's de jure rights are exclusionary. He is the only one who is granted power through them. 
Bugganout's de facto rights are inclusionary. Sal runs his own business, and Bugganout gets his say. Lee creates parallel instances of property destruction due to Black existence in spaces that are white according to de jure ownership, further illustrating conflicting claims of de jure and de facto rights. Notably, these occasions lead to very different results in the cases of Buggin' Out's Jordans and Radio Rahim's Radio. The next time we see Buggin' Out in the film, Clifton scuffs and ruins his previously pristine Air Jordans. You almost knocked me down, man. The word is excuse me. Ah, uh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Not only just knocked me down, you stepped on my brand new white Air Jordans that I just bought. And that's all you can say is excuse me. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. I'll fuck you up quick two times. Two times. Who told you to step on my sneakers? Who told you to walk on my side of the block? Who told you to be in my neighborhood? I own this brownstone. Who told you to buy a brownstone on my block in my neighborhood on my side of the street? Mm -hmm. Yo, what you want to live in a black neighborhood for anyway, man? Motherfuck gentrification. Well, Lee's camera angles in this scene place us, the viewers, directly into the action. The camera looks up on Buggin' Out as he argues and down on Clifton as he defends. More than simply conveying their relative heights, Lee is asserting Buggin' Out's dominant position in the argument. Essentially, Lee is privileging Buggin' Out's de facto ownership of his block, his neighborhood, his side of the street, over Clifton's deed to his brownstone. We see the same concept used in Lee's camera angles during the argument that leads to the destruction of Radio Rahim's radio and his death. Fight the power! Fight the power! We've got to fight the powers that be! Elvis was a hero to most, but he never meant shit to me as he straight out racist to suck away. What I tell you about that boy! What I tell you about that bitch! What the fuck are you dead up? Are you? Most of my heroes! We want the black people on that motherfucking floor of fame now! Tired of some fucking hoes and your own fucking day fucking out! We got jungle music on! We ain't enough! We ain't gonna be my jungle music! We ain't gonna be my Africa! It's about the fucking picture! It's about turning that shit off and getting the fuck out of my place! Here we find a series of arguments made by different people about the extent of their property rights. As we know, Buggin' Out's call for Black people on the wall at Sal's Famous is an assertion of his de facto property claim on the pizzeria. Sal asserts his de jure rights against Buggin' Out's claims, and Sal perceives Radio Rahim's music in the pizzeria as a kind of destruction of his, Sal's, de jure rights. Buggin' Out's use of the absolute for good in his hope of closing Sal down does the same in a more extreme manner. Where their de facto rights are not respected, both Radio Rahim and Buggin' Out react with an attempt to assert their rights in the same exclusionary manner as Sal's de jure rights. If it cannot be theirs, then it cannot be anyone's. This scene is a counterpoint to Buggin' Out's earlier claim against Sal. With it, Lee dramatizes the absolute lack of respect of de facto black rights by white property owners. When Lee ultimately destroys Sal's famous, he takes this one step further by dramatizing that white denial of black de facto rights ultimately destroys de jure and de facto property for all. When the credits roll, we see that Lee has dedicated this film to, among others, Michael Griffith's family. In the face of a world destroyed by racialized property rights, Lee is proposing a different kind of inheritance. His right thing is the redistribution of property. What he passes on to us is the question of how that will be done. 
The terms of this question are illustrated in the quotations he gives us from Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. We all stand to inherit the question of property rights that those 20 black leaders raised 155 years ago. the heart of Bed-Stuy, W-E-L-O-V-E.